hope that this time next year we are in person at the London Nelson Center. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, island fungi and the island biogeography of fungi. Um, biogeography of fungi is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about um, in a lot of different ways because it ties everything together. It's um, biogeography, it's ecology, it's taxonomy, really anything that you care to think about, uh, you can think about in the context of islands. Um, and as you'll see over the course of this talk, islands from the perspective of fungi are not um, necessarily what you might sort of be thinking of at first blush. Um, there's different ways to think about islands, and we'll talk about what that means um, from the perspective of something that straddles the microbial, macrobial perspective. Um, for example, fungi. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully this works. Can you all see this? Yes. yes? Okay, good. All righty. So Sky Islands and Dry Islands, the biogeography of macro fungi. Let's just get right into it. And um, if someone's monitoring the chat, great. I will try and have a look at it. But I also think that the group is small enough that you can turn on your mic and just directly ask a question, and, and I'll try and answer it. Okay, so island biogeography is a subset of biogeography in general. And biogeography is just what it sounds like. Bio meaning life, geography meaning place or map or spatial relationship of places on earth. So the question of biogeography is where do things live? And the questions of island biogeography are where do things live on islands? We could start with the definition of an island because most continents by some definition are islands. Most continents are bounded by water, but we don't think of continental land masses as islands. And even some big islands we don't think of as islands. The British Isles don't really count from the perspective of island biogeography in the same way that something like Hawaii counts. Uh, likewise, Borneo, New Zealand, these islands are so big that they are quasi-continental land masses and they don't act the same way as something like the California Channel Islands or the Azores or, um, or you know, the Galapagos. Those are different. And they're different because of a few variables that we'll talk about in a few seconds. Um, but the fundamentals of island biogeography are that immigration to islands from mainlands, and mainlands is sort of synonymous here with continental landmass, um, as well as speciation, which is the evolution of new species on those islands, are what add to the diversity of life on islands. And emigration and extinction, so um, organisms leaving islands or dying out on islands, uh, decrease the diversity of living things on islands. These are the two main additive and detractive forces of biodiversity on islands. Um, we can circumscribe broad patterns within these variables. Species diversity increases with area. So the bigger the island is, the more species of all kinds you expect to find on it. And it decreases with remoteness. So the further away from a mainland an island is, the less likely you are to have a large volume of species. Um, because it's harder for those initial colonists, those initial dispersers, those initial um, immigrants to arrive there. Uh, this is sort of intuitive. Um, it's much harder to get to the Galapagos than it is to get to Catalina Island. You can take a quick ferry in a few hours from LA to get to Catalina Island, but it takes you a very long time to get to the Galapagos, no matter who you are. Okay, so that's the general relationships of species diversity, area versus remoteness. Um, but there's also some relationships that have to do with uh, endemism. So endemic or uh, unique organisms to a particular place, um, that's a word you hear a lot in the realm of biogeography. If you study biogeography, endemic organisms are a major point of study because 
They are organisms that are highly tied to discrete geographic areas. Um, everything is endemic to Earth. That is the broadest possible geographic category you can draw. But the narrower you make your focus geographically, the more interesting from a biogeographic study perspective um, the endemic species is. So we often call these things narrow endemics. Um, you could say that any species is endemic as long as you draw the right area. But when we talk about endemics, we usually mean narrow endemics. And with island biogeography, we usually mean island endemics. Um, the likelihood that a large fraction of the species that live on an island are endemic to that island increases the farther that island is away from a mainland. And that stands to reason. That's fairly intuitive. Um, because the further you are from a mainland, the more likely it is that your lineage will have evolved to a point where it's different from your mainland ancestor or your mainland representative. The closest uh, relative on the mainland will have been isolated from you for longer, and your genetic divergence will be greater. And so you are more likely to be a narrow endemic. This also increases with the duration of time that the landmass that you're calling this island has been disjunct from a mainland. And this varies dramatically between islands. So some islands are only recently disjunct from mainlands. Some islands are brand new. We'll talk about this in a second, but volcanic hotspots in the middle of the Pacific sometimes create new islands um, that are, where we sort of witness their birth within a human lifespan. Um, they're, they're brand new. They're only 10, 20, 30 years old, which is remarkable. You can watch the, um, formation of new terrestrial crust and the inflow of bioplasm, um, living things to that island within a matter of a few years after its emergence above the surface of the sea. But many islands are millions of years old and have been above the surface of the sea for a long time. And the longer they are above that, um, above the surface of the sea, the more time they will have had for organisms to disperse to there from the mainland, and uh, thus they're less likely to have a, a high proportion of endemic species. Um, but you can see that all of these variables sort of interplay in ways that are sometimes at odds with each other. So you can have a very small island that's very far away from the mainland, and that's likely to have a lower species diversity, but a higher proportion of endemics. Or you can have a large island close to the mainland, which is likely to have more species, but fewer endemics. So there's like sliders on these variables that you adjust one and the other goes down, um, or you adjust both in the same direction and you get a large species diversity and a large percentage of endemics. You could argue that's the case for New Zealand. It's just a very large island with a relatively high degree of remoteness. Um, so these are some of the fundamentals of island biogeography. And these have been studied pretty well, these, these principles or these relationships for things like animals, for things like plants, um, even for some groups of relatively small animals like insects, these have been well studied. They have not been well studied from the perspective of mushrooms or fungi even. Um, and that's a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Early on, there was this idea um, the, it was termed the Bosbecking hypothesis after its two main authors. Um, and it summarized with this pithy aphorism, everything is everywhere and the environment selects. So the idea of the Bosbecking hypothesis was that spores or propagules or mycelium of fungal or microbial organisms more generally were present everywhere over the surface of the globe and that it was only the particularities of the environment in any given place that selected for the species that were actually encountered there. So the idea was that if you were to adjust the environmental variables in any given place, you would then have a bloom of the organisms that you found in other areas of the globe that experienced similar conditions. In more recent years, in the past century, most of the research that has been done on this idea has debunked it. It's not true that every microbial organism is uniformly distributed. That's sort of an antiquated idea at this point. And Kabir P.A., who's at Stanford, one of my favorite authors to um, read his articles, um, who studies mycorrhizal ecology, among other things, um, has been instrumental in debunking the idea of the Bosbecking hypothesis. 
not everything is everywhere. There is geographic structure to the um, to the sort of propagules or the spores or the mycelium of microbial organisms, including fungi. Um, Kabir had a particularly clever and um, experimental design for a lot of his work on island biogeography of fungi because he used individual tree islands or small tree islands at Point Reyes. So the idea of some of his research was that trees represent islands from the perspective of fungi. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. Um, so he didn't even need to use an island in the classical sense to do some of his research. Okay, but tonight I'm gonna to be talking about California's Channel Islands. And you'll also hear me say the California Archipelago. Um, archipelago is just a chain of islands. And that is what the California Channel Islands are. Um, these are the islands that are south of Point Conception. So Point Conception is Santa Barbara County and that extend all the way down south to San Diego County um, to the Mexican border. And as you'll see in a second, they actually extend further. Um, the Channel Islands are comprised of a northern group of four islands and a southern group of, depending on how you count it, three islands plus one outlier or another set of four islands. And they're well known for having a high degree of plant endemism. So when I say plant endemism, I mean plants that are specific to either individual islands within this archipelago or they're endemic to the archipelago as a whole, um, but they're not found on the mainland. These islands were inhabited by uh, Native Americans, by indigenous folks, specifically the Chumash tribe, um, until relatively recently and going back quite a ways into prehistory, perhaps as far as 30,000 years ago. In fact, some of the oldest evidence of um, human habitation of North America comes from the Channel Islands, really, really ancient human remains um, on the Channel Islands. These were places where there were thousands of people living um, prior to colonial contact. Uh, and some of the Chumash inhabitations there were specialized uh, as shell bead uh, craftsmen. So they would make uh, currency, shell, shell bead or shell money beads uh, as currency. Uh, so they would carve it out of mollusk shells. But in modern history, in post-colonial time, there's been really extremely intense disturbance to the ecosystems of the Channel Islands, primarily in two forms. One is military, um, and that continues to this day, where the Navy and the Air Force actually actively bomb on some of the Santa Cruz or some of the Channel Islands, specifically uh, San Nicolas Island, and even more intensely on San Clemente Island. They fire missiles, bombs, and live artillery and ammunition from the sand, from the sea, the land, and the air that land on, on San Clemente Island. But San Nicolas Island also has Navy installations. In fact, I think all of the islands have some Navy installation. But most of the Northern Channel Islands are now wrapped up in um, the Channel Islands National Park. And Catalina Island is the only one of the California Archipelago Islands that has a year round standing population of civilians. There's like neighborhoods on Catalina Island that are connected to the mainland by ferries. But probably more importantly, you know, it sounds bad to bomb the island and it is bad, um, but more importantly, grazing activities shortly after colonial contact really had a huge impact on the Channel Islands. Um, sheep, goats, elk, bison, cattle, uh, introduction of, of domestic cats, they're not grazers, but they do have a serious impact on seabirds, for example. All of these things had a really huge impact on the biotic character. And when I say biotic character, I mean the living organisms that form the habitats of the Channel Islands. Um, so here's a composite of all of the different California islands. Um, this is not how they're actually laid out. The group of four that you see at the upper left, those are Channel Islands National Park. That's the Northern group. San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. And then Santa Barbara, a little bit, is a tiny little postage stamp of an island to the southeast uh, of that group. And then San Nicolas Island is way, way, way offshore. It's the most remote of the Channel Islands. And then a little bit further, um, just off of Los Angeles, you have Santa Catalina. And then off of San Diego, you have San Clemente Island, which is a very long sort of north-south oriented skinny island. Um, 
but I'm specifically going to focus on the northern group of four islands because they were at one point all connected to each other in an island that is known in paleoecology as Santa Rosa Island. It was about 119 kilometers long. So this is when sea levels were somewhat lower um, and the islands were connected to each other and comprised about 1300 square kilometers. Um, for comparison, the North Island of New Zealand is about 70,000 square kilometers. So even in, in prehistory, Santa Rosa Island is much smaller than New Zealand's North Island. This was not a huge island, although it's very big. I mean, it is a large island um, from the perspective of island biogeography. Um, a lot of other oceanic islands are, are much smaller than this. So you can see in this diagram the ancient shorelines at 100 million years ago, 120 million years ago, and then current in beige. And you can see that those four islands were one giant landmass just off the coast of what is modern day Santa Barbara, but also the coast of the mainland extended further out into the ocean. And so there was only about seven kilometers between Santa Rosa Island and the mainland of what we now call California, the Central California coast. And this distance is important. Um, even nowadays, um, you'll see online sometimes hyperbolic uh, language about the Channel Islands saying, oh, they're remote islands. They're not remote. They are very close to the mainland. That's almost the most interesting thing about them from the perspective of island biogeography is that they're not far. They have a high potential for dispersal. But what's nice is that you have a natural experiment in the sense that they kind of form a daisy chain of distance from the mainland. And you can go from one island being very close to the next island being a little bit less close to the next island being somewhat distant to San Miguel and San Nicolas Islands being extremely distant. Um, well, extremely in the context of the Channel Islands, but not extremely distant in the context of global oceanic islands. Um, but when you think of the California archipelago, you should not consider it to be a truly remote island chain. When we talk about remote islands, we're talking about Easter Island. We're talking about Kerguelen Island. We're talking about um, the Galapagos. Those are truly remote oceanic islands. These are not remote. Um, they're more interesting because of their proximity than anything. Um, but just to point out how close they were in prehistory, there was a species of mammoth that swam from the mainland to the ancient Santa Rosa Island landmass and lived on the islands. So these elephants were able to cross what was then a very narrow channel, what's now still a relatively narrow channel, but much larger um, between the mainland and the islands. And they lived there. There's fossils of ma mammoths from the island. Uh, one more island I want to mention is indicated at the bottom of the screen here. This is Guadalupe Island off of the coast of Baja California. And it is actually quite a bit more remote than any of the California archipelago islands. It is further offshore and it's further south, not really, there's no intermediate stepping stone islands to connect it to the main landmass. Curiously, it does have mushrooms. We There's been almost no attention paid to it, but we know that Amanita muscaria grows there. There are pines, there are Tory pines and Bishop pines, if I remember correctly, on this island, really disjunct populations of both of those pine trees, but there is, mycorrhizal fungi that live there, including Amnita muscaria and some others. So this is definitely um, the next step in understanding the Pacific Coast Island chain. Hopefully we'll get there someday. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just going to talk about the Northern Islands. So the islands, as I just mentioned, have disjunct populations of trees. Um, but these plants are really important from the perspective of the fungi that live there, because as you all know, plants are a critical contributor to the aspect of a habitat that supports fungi. Oaks have oak fungi, manzanitas have manzanita fungi, pines have pine fungi. There is some amount of specificity between mushrooms and the uh, photosynthetic organisms they live with. So over on the left there, that's Quercus tomentella. That's one of the island oaks. Um, and it is endemic to just a few of the large islands in the northern part of the archipelago. And on the right, you have one of the manzanitas that's endemic to the Channel Islands. Um, so these are biotic variables that contribute to the likelihood of endemic fungi living on the island because they don't exist on the mainland. 
if any mushrooms co-evolve or adapt to live specifically with these plants, they're only going to be able to do so in the context of where those plants live, and that's the islands, not the mainland. Um, but this raises a good question of what exactly we mean by the word native. What plants are native or endemic to these islands? Well, we're pretty clear that pigs, sheep, and bison are not native to the California Channel Islands because they were introduced there within recorded history by humans. Um, it was a commercial industry. But goats, some people have argued that there was a San Clemente Island breed of goat um, because they were introduced to the islands and then they diverged so much in their relatively short generation time as to achieve a different appearance. And um, there was even a movement for a while to preserve the San Clemente Island goat on the island as if it were some sort of protected island endemic. Thankfully, that didn't uh, gain a lot of traction and they were eventually removed from the island and sold to goat fanciers, which is great. It's a, a good all around solution for both the biodiversity of the island that actually is a native endemic, um, as well as for these goats that although they were lovely, they were doing pretty serious damage to the um, to the plant life of, of San Clemente Island. Um, we know exactly when black rats were introduced to um, the Channel Islands, when the ship SS Winfield Scott shipwrecked on the islands in the mid 1800s and rats escaped from the ship onto the island and started to wreak havoc on the seabirds that bred on the island, as well as eating the seeds of endemic plants like the um, Santa Cruz Island mallow. Um, this is uh, Malva is the genus, um, but it is a bush forming, beautiful purple flowered mallow family plant that many place names on the island are related to, but which went almost extinct on all the islands because its seeds are so heavily predated by rodents, um, as well as the bushes themselves were eaten away by grazers. But you could even ask whether oaks are native on Santa Cruz Island because we have good evidence that um, Native Americans were transporting acorns from the mainland to the island via tomols. These are their dugout canoes um, because acorns were a major food source for them. So they wanted to encourage oak forests to grow up on the islands. And so they were sort of cultivating these gardens or these forests of food plants, including many oaks that probably would not have had a good chance of dispersing there on their own. Black oaks and valley oaks are, for example, part of the sort of odd assemblage of oaks that you find on Santa Cruz Island, despite the fact that they're not very common in the immediate mainland um, bordering the islands. So it becomes complicated when you're trying to take account for what is native and what is introduced uh, on, on the Channel Islands. Um, it's a matter of history, um, both in terms of depth of time, at what point do you start counting something as native or naturalized, and do you count um, human involvement in dispersal as something that is quote unquote natural. Um, even the island foxes, this tiny little relative of gray foxes that live on the islands, are they bear many of the hallmarks of domestication. Their ears are round, they're very tame and docile. They approach you very closely. Um, if you go to Santa Cruz Island, they'll forage within a few feet of you. They were probably brought to the islands by Native Americans on their dugout canoes and were perhaps even traded uh, in between islands as sort of gifts or status symbols between um, uh, different sort of sub-tribes. Uh, and they were perhaps kept in camp as a way of controlling rodent populations like wood rats um, from getting into their granaries or their stores of food. So even the island foxes, there's some question as to how you would tally them as native or recent introduction. Okay, so how do we characterize the California archipelago by geographically? Well, first of all, they feel more northern than they are. If you are to draw a straight line from any of the California archipelago islands to a corresponding point on the mainland, you will find a more characteristic assemblage of northern plants on the island than you do on the corresponding point on the mainland. Because they are more maritime, they're a little bit cooler, they're a little bit wetter they get a little bit more precipitation because they are the first thing that storms encounter as they move in from the predominantly um, Western storm track of, of storms coming in from the Pacific. So a lot of precipitation falls on the islands first before it hits the mainland. 
That said, they're also somewhat sheltered by point conception. So storms that move from north to south tend to hit point conception, and so the islands are in a little bit of a rain shadow. So it's a balancing act. The further west you are, like San Miguel Island, you are more likely to get a little bit more precipitation. And the further south you are um, in the shadow of point conception, the less likely you are to get as much rain as you otherwise would. There's a limited number of plant hosts on the island. So not every plant that is present on the mainland has dispersed successfully to the islands. Um, there's a smaller number of overall plant hosts for mycorrhizal species to associate with. Another thing we simply can't overlook at this point is that when you're studying organisms on the Channel Islands, you have already lost your baseline of what they used to be like. Within recorded history, they have been so heavily disturbed that you cannot consider them to be anything other than a highly human impacted habitat. They are a site of disturbance and we are only seeing the post disturbance aftermath of what once lived there. Um, that said, you also do see a little bit of release from competition. Some organisms that otherwise would have a lot of competition with the diversity, full diversity of fungi on the mainland um, seem to be doing better on the islands than they do on the mainland, perhaps because they don't compete with as many other species of fungi. That's a very hard thing to prove. It's really conjectural. It has a lot to do with feel. It has a lot to do with uh, deep field experience on the mainland and then going to the island and feeling that things behave somewhat differently or appear somewhat differently. There's probably no way to rigorously test this, um, at least given our current knowledge, but it's something that I hope people will focus on in the future is what are the asymmetries between competition on the mainland versus competition on the islands from a fungal perspective. But that will be for future generations. So I just want to sort of characterize a few of these islands right now. Here's Santa Cruz Island and a map of the existing um, fungal collections um, on iNaturalist uh, just a few years ago when I first put this talk together, relatively sparsely covered. It's hard to get around this island because there's no permanent roads, really. There are some dirt roads that act as fire roads for the very few vehicles that live on the island permanently, but there's no ferries that bring new vehicles to this island routinely. You can't really get around except in one of the three or four vehicles that live there or on foot. Those are your only options for getting around. Um, but it's a beautiful island. It is the largest of the Santa Cruz of the Channel Islands and it is the most vegetationally dense. There's forests there, a um, lot of trees, um, really big diversity of habitats, and it's in relatively good shape. It has recovered fairly well from its past history of grazing. Even though it was grazed intensively, it's so big and so rugged that there was a lot um, protected from grazing activity. Santa Rosa Island is the, the near neighbor to Santa Cruz Island. And as you can see, there's very little bit, there's you know almost no records of fungi on iNaturalist because this island is even more difficult to get around for the average visitor. There's only a few trails for you know, the general public to walk around on. There's really not much in the way of roads and it was hammered pretty hard by grazing activities. It has less topographic relief than Santa Cruz Island and had a lot of vegetation. So it was, targeted pretty heavily by um, ranchers um, for a long time. Grazing animals were only removed from the Channel Islands in very recent history, the 70s and 80s. Um, and even the 90s, I think there were still grazing animals on the Channel Islands. But on Santa Rosa Island, there's this remarkable forest of Torrey Pines. Um, Torrey Pines, if any of you are from San Diego, you know that there's that Torrey P Pines State Park in North County. And this is one of the rarest conifers in the Northern Hemisphere. It's a very, very um, range restricted pine species that deserves a lot more attention from a macrofungal perspective. There are probably a lot of Torrey pine specific species that we don't know very much about because Torrey pines don't get wet very often. They're often, um, they live in dry places and so they don't produce a lot of fruit bodies. But this stand of Torrey pines that you see in this picture is right on, um, right on the shore of Santa Rosa Island and it gets wet every year. There's probably a lot of mushrooms that fruit here if you arrive at the right time to see them. San Miguel Island is the furthest out um, the, the westernmost of the northern islands. And you can see from this aerial view these streaks of sand. Um, and that's because it's a little bit outside the shadow of Point Conception and it's heavily windswept. Those streaks of sand 
are wind pushed dune systems that are sort of creeping across the island. It's really a sand blasted island. There's really no trees to speak of beyond a few willows here and there. There's no woody trees, there's no pines, there's no oaks like you get on the in interior islands. Um, but there are mushrooms there. There's only a few records right now, but we're hoping that with additional um, focus in the near future, we will find a lot more fungi on San Miguel Island. Because as you'll see from my examples in a few slides, uh, even San Nicolas Island, which is fairly comparable to San Miguel Island in some ways, there are mushrooms there. So here's what San Miguel Island looks like in the summer. Um, the foreground looks dead, but these are actually just dormant giant Coreopsis plants. This is a, a sunflower family plant that's more or less endemic to the Channel Islands. There is one patch on the, on the mainland, but you really get its um, the core of its range is out on the Channel Islands. This is what the vegetation of San Miguel Island looks like. In the background there, you see some dormant Coreopsis, um, but in the foreground, you see Astragalus, you see um, Eridron, you see uh, Isocoma. These are sort of the dominant vegetation of the island. These little canyons and drainages do actually have a lot of plants in them, but there's really no permanent drainages, no permanent water flow on San Miguel Island. Whereas on Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz, you do have year round water flows in some of their drainages. So what does academic research into the mushroom assemblages of the Channel Islands look like? Well, up until 2012, there was only a few cursory trips. Um, there were some community college trips led by um, folks from Santa Barbara in the 80s and maybe 70s even. I have to look at my notes. But they really took really basic notes. They didn't do any serious um, uh, sampling or preserving or vouchering of the fungi they found. They were really just making somewhat cursory species lists. So there were a few specimens, um, virtually no photos existed at, at all. But in the in the years around 20 uh, or 2000, Tom Bruns and Lisa Grubisha from UC Berkeley actually started to assemble a real list of fungi they were finding on Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Island. And then community science started visiting, uh, scientists started visiting in 2012 and using Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist really started to flesh out our overview of what mushrooms live out here on the California uh, archipelago. Um, I'll talk more about that in a bit, but I want to profile San Nicolas Island really quickly because San Nicolas is the most distant from the mainland of all the Channel Islands. And unfortunately, it also has the lowest topographic relief. It's a very flat island. And so when grazers were introduced to San Nicolas Island, they were able to get wherever they wanted. They were able to cross the whole island. And so they ate virtually everything. Um, this is a view from the air. You can see it's a relatively small island. You could walk around the whole thing in a couple days. Um, you can drive across the whole thing in an afternoon because there are roads here because it's a Navy owned island. There's no public access to San Nicolas, um, but it's small. It's distant, um, so you have two different um, variables within the framework of island biogeography acting on its assemblage. Um, because it's small, theory predicts that it will have a smaller number of species. Um, because it's distant, theory predicts that we'll have a smaller number of species, but perhaps a higher number of endemics. However, because of grazing activities due to sheep and goats, it was almost sterilized. There was virtually no green vegetation left on the island. This was compounded by the fact that grazing coincided with some serious drought years in California's history. So it was grazed to the bone, then there were some drought years, and then wind swept across the island and blew away whatever remaining soil there was. So it was really a barren landscape for a long time. However, when grazers were removed, it did bounce back. And there's now huge fields of giant Coreopsis leptosini that are found there. You can see in the background of this image that if you go there at the right time of year, it's just a field of yellow. There's leptosini everywhere. It is also still home to some rare endemic and endangered snails that found shelter in the patches of native cactus because the grazing animals would not probe too deeply into the spiny cactus. And so the cactus patches acted as refuges for plant seeds, as well as for some of these uh, mollusks and microinvertebrates that are endemic to the islands. It was presumed that some of these snails are primarily mushroom eating or fungus eating. And because of this, 
in 2019, I was um, brought out to San Nicolas Island with the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden to study the fungi of the islands to figure out what these snails might be eating. Um, and this is what probably the rarest of the snails looks like. This is the San Nicolas Island fraternal sna snail, Micrarianta feralis. There's other snails there as well. And Bill Hoyer, um, William Hoyer, was the Navy biologist on island at the time. And these were his study group, his focus organisms. He really cared about these, um, these mollusks, endemic mollusks of San Nicolas Island. Um, and actually, for those of you who are interested, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is putting on a, um, a symposium on the recovery of the Channel Islands since uh, grazing days. So the, the restoration efforts on the Channel Islands uh, on the 25th of February, if I recall correctly, and online registration is free. So if you go to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden website, you can register for that symposium. It's on the 25th of February. Uh, so anyways, we visited this island, we targeted the habitats where these snails had been found, and we did find a lot of mushrooms. Even in just three or four days of surveying, we didn't spend very much time at all, but it was very intense. We were out for 10 hour days for four days. So we spent quite a bit of time trying to saturate the species curve given the amount of time we had. And we found about 110 species. I think that number is actually a bit higher now, um, closer to 130. Um, but that's an amazing count for four days of effort on an island that was virtually sterilized in recent history and living, mem living memory. Um, it was really diverse in Agaricus, Antiloma, Puffballs, and Satheralaceae. What connects all of these groups is that their spores tend to be large, thick-walled, as well as highly pigmented and or ornamented and textured. And that's not a coincidence. These are traits that we consider to be functional traits. These are traits that have consequences for the survival and dispersal capacity of these fungal organisms. So it's telling that we don't find a huge diversity of Mycena and Tricholoma, which are pale spored and thin walled, but rather we find these dark spored, um, large spored, thick walled, highly textured species out there. Um, so there are patterns to the functional traits of species that we find in highly disturbed and distant islands compared to um, more stable mainland habitats. I'm seeing some questions coming um, <laughs> into the chat. Someone asked, what's the best time to observe mushrooms on the Channel Islands? And Stu replied during a bomb cyclone. Um, I'll get to this in a second, but Stu was recently on Santa Cruz Island with me during the first waves of this last atmospheric river event. Um, and in fact, that turned out to be a really good time to be on the Channel Islands. Thankfully, we were there for the first wave of impacts and not for the second and third waves of those impacts because we probably would have been stuck there until now. Um, but to answer Dan's question a little bit less glibly, it's about the same mushroom season as the mainland um, because once again, they're not really far offshore. They do um, respond to the same kinds of environmental variables that the mainland experiences, but they do have a somewhat um, erratic season. Um, because they're a little bit cooler and a little bit more fog bound a lot of the time, um, they do they can persist into their fruiting into the spring. Um, so there are some good mushroom seasons recorded from Santa Cruz Island into April and May. Um, but then again, places like San Clemente Island and San Nicolas Island are quite dry. They're kind of like desert islands. And a lot of years, they just don't receive much precipitation at all. And so you can go there in December and January, and it's bone dry compared to the mainland, which usually has at least some moisture. So you really, if you want to survey fungi out there, you have to take advantage of what's happening in that moment. Um, this is one of the main challenges to surveying fungi of the Channel Islands is that you have to be nimble and you have to respond immediately. When it looks like it's wet out there, you've got to get out there. And that's oftentimes corresponding to a difficult time to reach the islands because the waves are choppy and the ferries don't run or the planes don't run or you get there and then you're stuck because the roads are flooded. And that's in fact what happened to us on Santa Cruz Island most recently. Um, but this is on San Nicolas Island. Um, this is a, an inosibi um, that grows with the willows, which are native there. They're one of the only native woody trees on San Nicolas Island. And it just shows you that mycorrhizal fungi do reach the distant Channel Islands. Um, there's fewer of them. There's less mycorrhizal assemblage there than there is decomposer fungi. 
um, because there's fewer hosts for them to partner with, but there, there are mycorrhizal fungi there. Um, but this brings us to ecological innovations on the islands. And this is a, sort of a narrative. It's a story that I'm trying to piece together about how fungi behave ecologically, how they interact with other organisms on the Channel Islands. And what I mean by ecological innovation is that I mean, if you disperse there, if your spores get there as a fungus, and your host or your, your partner that you interact with on the mainland isn't there, what does your lineage do over time? And it appears that there's at least some cases where you could argue that there's an ecological innovation going on, where they figure out a way to make a living on the island, despite the fact that their preferred substrate or their preferred host isn't there. Um, so on many of the islands, you can't find wood easily. San Nicolas Island, San Miguel Island, Santa Barbara Island, you don't find wood um, very much. There's some willows, but beyond the willows, um, there's no true wood. There's not much lignicolous substrate to, to decompose. So if you're a, a wood decomposer, you either adapt or you perish. And it looks like in some cases, we've got lineages of fungi that have adapted to these different resource classes. So remember I said that yellow flowering field of leptosony on San Nicolas Island, that is the closest thing you've got to wood on this island besides the willows. Um, it's a dominant habitat type across most of the island and it's got a wood-like texture, but it's more like um, an agave stock. It is pseudo wood. There's no lignin involved. It's just very large diameter coarse cellulose tissue. But there are species that appear to decompose it. So Ossicollis is a relatively rare genus on the mainland. There is um, one other species that you find on the mainland that decomposes spruce wood up in Northern California. But this tiny little species we found in 2019 first on San Nicolas Island and have since got records of from uh, San Miguel Island and Santa, uh, Santa Cruz Island most recently. And it decomposes these pseudo woody stalks of the leptosony. Um, someone asked, wouldn't dark spores also correspond to melanin and heavy uh, infrared radiation? And yeah, that's exactly right. That's why we suspect that these dark spored species are more predominant proportionally on the islands is that there's relatively less shade on, on an island like San Nicolas. It doesn't have much tree cover. So if you're gonna persist there in the soil as a fungal spore, um, you're going to do better with melanized cell walls because it protects you from the DNA damage that correlates with um, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Um, so there's more dark spore lineages disproportionately represented on the island than there are pale spore lineages. However, this Ossicollis is one of them. This is a white spore species. So it's not like there's none, it's just that it's a disproportionate balance compared to the mainland. There's also an oyster mushroom that grows out there on the islands on the wood of this leptosony. And you can see the flowers of this plant in the background there. Um, it's basically just a big sunflower bush that goes dormant half of the year and loses all its fern-like leaves and just looks like sort of dead gray trunks. And those dead gray trunks, when they actually die, they fall on the ground. And this oyster mushroom is only really as big as, big as a nickel um, or a quarter. Maybe some of the biggest caps are three inches across, but it's a small oyster mushroom compared to any of the oyster mushrooms you find on the mainland. Um, curiously, we got some DNA data for it and it appears to be closely related to a oyster mushroom that lives in New Zealand very closely related to an oyster mushroom that lives in New Zealand that grows on, once again, a non-woody substrate. Very curious rhyming, ecological rhyme between these two small oyster mushrooms on two different island ecosystems across the world. We actually brought this oyster mushroom. I don't know if Vel is in the chat tonight, but Velani, who was working at Far West Fungi at the time, um, I, I brought a sample of these oyster mushrooms back from the island and, and Vel took it and grew it out in culture and cultivated it and fruited the oyster mushrooms on these sawdust blocks, just like any other, other oyster mushroom, but they retained their small size and their yellowish color, which proved to us that it was not simply a matter of substrate, not simply a matter of environment, but that you could bring these oyster mushrooms into cultivation, they would retain their unique characteristics and, and show that their morphology was actually uh, different from any of the oyster mushrooms 
spectrums that we saw on the mainland. Okay, so most recently, we were on Santa Cruz Island at the beginning of the year, just uh, January 2nd through, well, it ended up being through the 7th, I guess, um, because we got stuck for an extra day because of the atmospheric river flooding the main road on the island. We were not able to use um, vehicles, which we were planning to. So all of what you see are tracks on iNaturalist here. That was all covered on foot. We, we scattered all over the island. Um, a few of our friends actually were on the west end of the or the east end of the island unbeknownst to us also recording fungi at the same time so those little dots over by scorpion point are not our our group we were centered on the mainland or the main part of the island um, but we did some pretty good coverage um some of you may recognize these faces dean lyons um, maria morrow so maria gave a talk last year damon tai over on the right there some of you have probably met michelle torres grant she's in the foreground there julian pometa who some of you may know through the Fungus Federation because he did a flora of the Arboretum. And then last night, speaker Stu over on the left there, um, we were all together staying at the UC field station for a few days. And we spread out and we collected a bunch of mushrooms and we brought Santa Cruz Island up into the top tier of um, known data for any of the California archipelago. There's now almost 2000 observations of fungi from Santa Cruz Island pretty much thanks to our group. They, they, they took it from about 1,000 to almost 2,000 within the course of a week. Um, now fully head and shoulders ahead of Catalina Island, which is the next most uh, data rich island from the perspective of fungi. Um, but we made a bunch of voucher specimens. We're gonna get some DNA sequences soon. So Santa Cruz Island remains the best known of the islands from the perspective of macro fungi, but that doesn't mean that the other islands don't have a lot more to offer. We just haven't really been able to focus effort there in any sustained way yet. So we really hope to be able to balance this sort of effort curve um, in the coming decade, but it's gonna take some work and some nimbleness and some flexibility on the part of community scientists, because as you all know, if you ever met any academic scientists, they don't tend to be able to get up and leave their desks immediately. They're usually embedded in teaching classes or applying for grants or writing research. It's much easier to ask a bunch of amateurs, people like um, you and me who are not necessarily professionals um, to get up and get on one of these ferries for a weekend and just go there for three or four days, camp at one of the campgrounds that the National Park Service runs and just make observations that you upload to iNaturalist. And that's the way we actually accumulate um, robust data over time. So I really do think the Channel Islands are an example of where community science is more likely to generate good data than academics could ever really hope to um, because of the persistence and granularity of focus that, that we can bring. But there's a lot of cool things on the islands. Merasmus placatalis, you all know from the mainland, it appears to be really happy on the islands. Perhaps it is an example of something that has been released from competition um, because you will find thousands of Merasmus placatalis on the islands, really large specimens, seemingly larger than you ever find on the mainland, really richly colored. And in fact, they come in three different color morphs on the island. And this is something that we noticed, especially in our, our last visit, is that mushrooms seem to be slightly differently colored on the islands than their comparable specimens on the mainland of the same species. That's a perhaps a, a function of genetic drift. Perhaps um, some species that are richly colored sort of by chance became more common on the island than the mainland, but maybe there's something else going on there. This deserves some study, but it's gonna be hard to do without real sustained attention. Here's the other, one of the other morphs of, uh, color morphs of Merasmus on the island. This is orange. So the first one is the typical one you see on the mainland, kind of maroon or burgundy. The other one is orange. And then the last one that I've only seen once on the Channel Islands is this pastel pink form. Um, what's going on here, I don't know, but I've never seen this on the mainland. I've never seen observations of this pastel pink form on the mainland. Perhaps this is something that has to do with a smaller genetic uh, founder effect on the islands. I don't know what's going on here, but it's certainly an intriguing observation. Um, Luke Nasabi. So here's um, something that we saw a ton of hundreds of, maybe even thousands of during our last visit. And when I first went there in 2012 to Santa Cruz Island, um, I took this picture and I had no idea what it was. I had it sequenced and eventually Jimmy Veitch, 
um, on mushroom reserve recognized it as the European genus Leucoinosibi. We we don't know whether it's exactly the same as Leucoinosibi lenta in the strict sense, but what happened after we established this fact is that people started finding it all over the mainland. And it's always been on the mainland, but because the island tends to focus your attention, everything feels special, everything feels new, everything feels significant, you spend a little bit more time drilling down on the identities of what you find, and then you discover that you had overlooked it all this time on the mainland. And this happened to us multiple times. Um, most recently on, on the island, we found dozens of this specimen uh, of specimens of this Clytocella. It's an entelomatoid mushroom with pink spores. It's a very rare genus in California. There's only one other species that grows up in the northeastern corner of the state. In the east, uh, eastern United States, there is a species that's more common, uh, Clytocella papanalis and Clytocella mundula are both more common. But this thing was associated with um, uh, Santa Cruz Island buckwheat, Areogonum arborescens, which is a shrubby, a woody shrub, um, non-mycorrhizal. It's just decomposing the duff of this plant. And I thought, oh, surely this is an island endemic because there was hundreds of them um, or dozens of them anyways under this, this buckwheat. And sure enough, I got back to reception and I searched on the mainland and Jacob Kaligman, who many of you probably know as Jacob Polk, had found it in San Diego. So it is present on the mainland, but either it is rare or overlooked on the mainland. Once again, the island effect of narrowing your focus and making you take seriously all of the little bits of biodiversity in front of you reveals to you something you had overlooked, you had had in your, your, your blind spot on the mainland. Same goes from Erasmus albigrisius. Although we knew this one was present on the mainland, it is really common on the island. It seems to be one of the dominant species under buckwheats and under ceanothus on the island. There's endemic ceanothus on the island, and this is one of the species that seems to love growing in their litter. It does grow near, I think it, I've seen it in San Mateo County. I can't remember if I have records of it from Santa Cruz, but it is present in, our, in the Monterey Bay bioregion. Here's another example of a mushroom potentially adapting to a resource that it is normally co-evolved for, but suddenly absent on the island. This is Rhizopogon. Many of you have seen Rhizopogon. This is a very common genus on the mainland with pines. But the cool thing about this species is that it's not pine associated. Unlike all other Rhizopogons, this species is probably associated with Manzanita. Um, this is Rhizopogon mengii. It is present on the mainland as well in the chaparral of Southern California, but it's really common on the island. It's the dominant Rhizopogon on the island, probably. Perhaps um, it's there's one other there pine species that may approach it in abundance. Um, but in the absence of a conifer host, you get this Rhizopogon shifting over to a different plant family. In fact, a whole different category of plants. It switched from a gymnosperm, a conifer, to an angiosperm, a flowering plant. And it's not a coincidence that it switched to manzanita. Um, if you're familiar with madrone on the mainland, you know that many, many fungi that grow with conifers occasionally also grow with madrone, which is in the same family as manzanita. There's something about this plant family, the ericaceae, the heather or the manzanita or the blueberry family that appears to predispose um, or be, to be predisposed physiologically somehow to adopt or accept conifer associated mycorrhizal fungi in a way that other angiosperm families don't. Something worth a lot more study that is well known to mushroom pickers. There's, um, for example, uh, matsutake are really common with shore pines up north, but they cross over to madrones and manzanitas although they're a little bit complicated because they also cross over to tan oaks, so they've got some flexibility. Um, but there's a number of quaternarius um, that, and, and lexinum that are common with conifers that also grow with, um, with ericaceous plants. Okay, so let's talk briefly about Hawaii. Um, my friend Oscar took this background photo of this sort of volcanic landscape on Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is part of the United States politically, but biogeographically, it is really nothing like the rest of the United States. It is part of sort of Oceania in the broadest scope of 
geographic realms. Um, and it has a mushroom flora that's more reminiscent in some ways of what you find in New Zealand. It has waxy caps are one of its main groups of biodiversity, fungal biodiversity, including many endemic waxy caps that only grow in the high elevation forests um, that are unfortunately rapidly disappearing um, for a variety of reasons, largely due to invasive plants, but um, also long-term changes. Um, but recently, just like a few months ago, um, maybe one month ago, Jeff Stallman and his collaborators actually uh, published a paper on island biogeography of fungi, which made me really excited because this is something I've been thinking about for years. And they sort of examined the biogeography of fungi across a few different oceanic island systems, including Hawaii, the Galapagos, the Canary Islands, Madeira, the Azores, Cabo Verde, and Christmas Island. These are all seriously isolated, small um, oceanic islands with the exception of Hawaii, that, which has some landmass to it compared to those other systems. And they asked whether or not the basic assumptions and theoretical predictions of, of island biogeography held true for these island systems. And what they found was that the answer was yes, but it's somewhat complicated. Um, and they also asked whether or not extinction or evolution of new lineages um, was the driving sort of force behind endemicity in fungi. Um, so here's an example of those endemic waxy caps that you find in sort of mossy high elevation ecosystems of, of Hawaii. And it turns out that there was so much missing data um, that they had to make a lot of assumptions, a lot of theoretical assumptions to even put together the conclusions of this paper. And I found it somewhat odd that they didn't include data from larger um, island systems, for example, the California Channel Islands, where there is some data available, although I will admit that it's not robust enough data to be a perfect plug-in to the kind of study they were doing. Um, and that's really what motivates me to continue doing work on the California Channel Islands, is that if we're going to keep asking these sorts of theoretical questions about how biogeography works, how assemblages are assembled, how dispersal occurs, um, we're going to have to have better baseline data, which are the inputs for the models that are produced in, in papers like this. So they did what they could and they found some support for the basic assumptions of island biogeography. And they also found some support for the idea that cladogenesis or evolution of new lineages was the driving factor behind a lot of endemicity in island fungi, but with the major caveat that they're pretty data deficient. They didn't have enough robust, complete data from enough different kinds of island ecosystems to really answer the questions they were asking in a way that was satisfactory. Um, another paper came out recently about fungal dispersal across spatial scales that is obviously highly relevant to any question about um, island biogeography of fungi because that's how they get there is through dispersal of one form or another. And um, I'm just briefly going to show you this cool figure from this paper, which isn't really interpretable in any easy way, but these curves are intended to show and I, I laugh to even say this because the y-axis is labeled as relative importance. Now, if that strikes you as a weird thing to put on the y-axis, you're not alone. That is a weird thing to put on the y-axis because it doesn't necessarily mean anything obvious. What does relative importance mean? What are the units of importance? Um, I don't know how they calculated this, and I suspect that they didn't calculate it, and that's actually fine. Um, because I think the overall pattern or the overall lesson they're trying to get across here holds true. Um, they're trying to communicate a general idea, which is that different sorts of dispersal have different spatial patterns for fungi. You can expect that something like a bird will disperse you really far, but might only occur occasionally. Birds are not a main driver of fungal dispersal. They are not a common co-adapted way that fungi get around the world. But if they do disperse you, they may disperse you quite a long way because they fly really far. As opposed to mycelial exploration, which as you can see, the curve is very high at low spatial scales and very low at high spatial scales. The mycelium growing by itself is going to grow um, 
on the scale of a few meters or tens of meters, quite commonly, that will be very important for the dispersal of fungi. It may occasionally get into the upper scales of kilometers, but that's going to be less important as a, as a, as a general way that fungi get around the world. Earthworms may take you some middle distance. They may disperse you um, further than you normally would be able to disperse on your own as a fungus um, by ingesting spores that are in the soil and then crawling through the soil and then excreting it somewhere else. Um, invertebrates with wings may disperse you some intermediate distance. Mammals are probably actually quite important for a lot of fungi that are sequoid, truffle fungi um, that are eaten and then the mammal goes scampering quite a long distance compared to what the spore would otherwise be able to travel on its own. Um, wind, as we all know, wind is a major disperser of um, fungi. That's what most gilled mushrooms are doing is they're trying to get their spores liberated to the wind. But I find a little bit of discrepancy in my intuitive sense of how important wind is versus birds. They look like they have the same graph according to this paper. And I would say that that's actually, that can't really be the case um, based on my natural history experience with fungi. Wind must be more important, especially at intermediate spatial dispersal scales. So I would question the comparison between wind and birds here. That doesn't jive with my intuitive understanding. And there is quite a bit of data that we could go consult using spore traps and spore traps basically sample air out of the ambient environment and they tell you what's in it at any given time of day. And if you didn't already know, there's a strong time of day signal to different fungal community assemblages, which is really cool. Um, Sharifa Crandall, who was at UCSC for a long time, um, did some of this work on the UCSC upper campus and has published about it. So you can go look that up if you want. But what I find really interesting about this is uh, figure H or segment H of this figure, which is humans. Humans dispersing fungi, usually unknowingly, sometimes uh, almost or sort of collaterally knowingly when we move plants around intentionally, we move fungi with them. That's how Amanita phylloides, the death cap arrived in California. But I think it has a, an appropriate curve. We move them with relatively frequent occurrence, thus importantly, at both small and large spatial scales. So you get a curve that is sort of convex as opposed to the concave curves of some of these other dispersal mechanisms. This is all just theoretical. It's all very abstract. It, there's not a lot of concrete applicability of these uh, diagrams, but it's something that I certainly hope that we'll be able to integrate in our future, future research on island fungi. But what I want to close this talk with is that um, we've been using this word island without ever defining it. An island is a very human term. We made up the word island and we use it to refer to wet things surrounding dry things most commonly. But from the perspective of a fungus, there are things that are every bit as isolated as a wet island, um, but they're not surrounded by water dry islands and sky islands being examples of what I mean here. And in fact, these major habitat types across the North American continent, um, in some way, are each their own kind of island with varying degrees of isolation from the other habitats they are adjacent to. So um, not all islands are water bound. There are islands that are land bound, but which the surrounding land is of a very different quality and has some sort of difference that make it a dispersal barrier to fungi. Elevational gradients are an example of this. If you go from 10,000 feet to zero feet of elevation within just a few miles, that's a huge gap or a huge barrier to dispersal. Idaphic is just a fancy word meaning um, precipitation, temperature, uh, pH, soil chemistry, anything non-living. Um, these sorts of gradients can have very pronounced uh, clinal sort of uh, walls or sort of sudden transitions that are not really soft gradients, but they're actually just harsh gradients, uh, more like distinct lines, uh, what we call edaphic breaks. And then there's the particularities of the thing you're talking about. So if you're talking about springtails, certain things will be barriers to dispersal. If you're talking about fungi, 
that same barrier might be less or more of a barrier. If you're talking about a dolphin, that may be a totally different kind of barrier to dispersal. If you're talking about a bird, it may not be a barrier to dispersal at all. So whenever we talk about what an island is, we have to talk about it just the same way we talk about endemicity or endemics. We have to talk about it with a particular organism in mind. There is no general or anonymous organism. Every organism has particularities of its life history and of its biology that are relevant to the question of what constitutes a barrier. So what are fungal concerns becomes the main question we ask ourselves. And when we talk about macrofungi, which is what I'm mostly interested in, precipitation is a major fungal concern. Host, if your host is not present, that's a major concern if you're a mycorrhizal species. If there's no accumulated organic matter, um, even if you're not necessarily a host limited mycorrhizal species, if there's nothing for you to digest, that's a major fungal concern. So places like the sky islands of the desert southwest are islands. They are dry sky islands. They are surrounded by desert and dispersing from mountaintop to mountaintop is every bit as challenging as dispersing from the mainland to an island. So island biogeography in the real world doesn't operate under perfect theoretical constraints. Um, there is no perfect test tube island. Every island that you want to use as an example of a or an illustrating example of a biogeographic principle has some major asterisks next to it. Um, it is either more distant than you would hope given its size, or it's had a history of grazing, or there is a lot of human dispersal of spores to that island, so you can no longer tell what's native and non-native anymore. Everyone has some provisos or some caveats that make it compromised from the perspective of pure theory. And it's only by getting more data about more island ecosystems that we'll be able to answer questions about fungal island biogeography in a way that is robust, that actually has some connection to real patterns and real, real mechanisms. This is uh, Mount Lassen in the background here. Um, and it is a snowy, high elevation landscape, 10,000 feet. It's not super high per se, but it's high enough that it gets above timberline. At this, or at this latitude of the world. It's a very snowy place in the winter. It has some of the deepest snow accumulations of anywhere in California. And it's got mountain hemlocks. And that combination of snow and hemlocks means that it's got Hygrophorus getzii in the spring. Hygrophorus getzii is a mycorrhizal mushroom that is strongly host limited. It only grows with hemlock, which means that it is functionally an island dweller because High elevation mountaintops are separated from each other by low elevation intervening lands. And you can see this in the map of where Hygrophorus getzii lives in the Western United States. It's mountaintop to mountaintop with just dots tracing out the Cascades and Northern Sierras, where mountain hemlock grows at high elevation. There is no intervening connective tissue or connective habitat. Um, you can see that it even makes a really broad jump over to Idaho, a really wide jump over to Idaho. And that, that point is a good point. I fact-checked it. That's a real observation of a real Hygrophorus getzii. Um, so sometimes just the map of the organism will show you that it's acting as if it lives on a chain of islands. This is functionally an archipelago of mountaintops. Um, like I said earlier, the dry islands of, of Southeast Arizona um, are as distant from any source populations of forest um, as, they, as the Channel Islands are. I mean, the Channel Islands are much closer to mainland forests than the Chiricahuas are to any of the connective tissue or the connective habitats that they represent a disjunct patch of, the Sierra Madre of, of Mexico. So you can see just how isolated these um, sky islands are in Southeast Arizona. There's desert all around them. Very low elevation, very hot, very dry, saguaro, cactus, creosote, sagebrush landscapes. But up on top of those mountains, you have spruce forest and oaks and pines and aspen even. So it's like being in Canada, but re being in a very disjunct part of Canada really far south. Another way of saying this is it's like being in the Sierra Madre of Mexico, which lies to the south, um, but is separated by major, major intervening deserts. Um, Oak is a great example of something that is an important habitat type for a huge range of fungi. They are oak associated, but there are two major gaps in the North American landmass where it's so dry 
and so low elevation um, or so homogeneous that there are very few oaks to act as connective tissue between populations um, of those fungi associated with them. So in the East Coast, you have a huge contiguous forested landmass um, that is suddenly split by the Great Plains in the middle of the United States, sort of um, Eastern Colorado, Western Kansas, all the way down into Central Texas. Um, but if you follow those oaks south into the Mexican sort of uh, the two different Sierra Madre, Sierra Madre Eastern Oriental and Sierra Madre Occidental, the Western um, sort of swath, these two very green, very verdant mountain forest ecosystems converge in central Mexico. And you get this sort of connective pathway that oaks sort of follow. And then you run into the Rockies, which are sort of a high elevation barrier. And you do get oaks crossing the Rockies, but then you have the Great Basin Deserts of Nevada, the Basin and Range Province, which is dry. And then you get the Mojave and Death Valley and the Sierra Nevada acting as another barrier to dispersal. And then you have coastal California with its live oak assemblage. But the fungi that live with these oaks show some of that patterning. So if you follow, for example, Buterobilitis or Exudoporus frostii from the Eastern United States down into Mexico, it has followed the Sierra Madre Occidental, the Western arm, back up into Arizona, Southeast Arizona, and even into, apparently, Colorado, or I guess that's Northern Arizona still. But this is the pr proposed biogeographic route. Um, it also goes down into Costa Rica, or at least some kind of vicariant relative evolutionary sister species lives in Central America. Um, there's oaks all the way down into Colombia that cross the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and the Isthmus of Panama um, into Northern South America. Pines, by the way, drop out in Nicaragua, but oaks continue all the way down into South America. So you can see that there's some, some connectivity, some genetic flow that follows the host plant. Um, wherever there's available habitat, the symbionts follow. Um, and Buterobilitis frostii or Exudoporus frostii is not the only one. Um, there's all of these Eastern boletes and not just boletes, there are other fungi, Eastern mycorrhizal fungi that follow oaks all the way from the East Coast down into Mexico and up into Southeast Arizona and um, this is thought to have sort of a complicated interplay with the changing Pleistocene climate. It used to be cooler and wetter um, across a lot of the West, and then it dried out. Um, and now we sort of have this modern times where there's intervening desert in between these source populations, but you have relict or ancient populations that are still left over from a more connected forested uh, ecosystem across the United States landmass. So uh, the main points I wanted to point out to you tonight is that island biogeography from the perspective of macrofungi is a really fascinating but poorly understood topic. Globally, we have a lot of different ways of approaching it. We know a little bit, but really we're still in the data deficient stance. We need more information about who these fungi are, how closely related they are to their source ancestor populations, um, and just, we need basic information about their diversity and their, the assemblage um, present on these different kinds of islands, both oceanic islands, sky islands, and dry islands. So I encourage you, if you are a Californian, coastal California, living anywhere near Ventura and Los Angeles especially, to consider taking trips out to Catalina Island, um, Santa Cruz Island, San Miguel, Santa Rosa are all publicly accessible, including Santa Barbara Island even. Um, you can camp in National Park Service campgrounds on a lot of these islands. Your observations there will be more valuable than almost any other observation of macrofungi you can make in the whole state. Um, you will be one of the first people to really seriously pay attention to mushrooms if you go to any of these islands. We're still in very early days of knowing what lives there in any sort of recorded way. So it's an exciting time to spend time there. It's a really charismatic place to be. Any of these islands um, will be a fun place to go for you. Um, you won't regret it. And if you add your observations to iNaturalist, they will eventually become part of the research program that um, people like me and Stu and Maria and Julian um, are all sort of pursuing getting together a picture of what lives here. So thanks for having me tonight. Oh, one, one last thing I wanted to point out is that fungi are not even limited by the island itself. They can bring their own island. Um, this study by Tom Horton, 
and some some of his affiliates, um, he studied in the same lab as Kabir P.A. for a while, showed that a single inoculum of Swillus pungens, or sorry, Swillus luteus, can facilitate invasion by pine species in non-native habitat in South America. So the fungus actually creates its own habitat by, by allowing for pine seedlings to live and grow up into mature trees, thus allowing for further invasion of mycorrhizal associates. So uh, it's not always clear cut that the island comes before the fungus. Sometimes the fungus comes before the island. Okay, time for questions. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, someone said, how, how do you think the oldest endemic fungi arrived in the Channel Islands? Did they float across the seven kilometers from the ancient shoreline, travel with flying insects, or did they come across the spores carried on air currents? I think all of those probably occurred. Um, I think seven kilometers is well within the dispersal range of spores, but I think insects are very likely to also have made it there. We know that spores survive through gut passage in rodents as well as rodents and then owls or hawks. So a hawk could have eaten a rodent who had eaten a truffle on the mainland, flown across the channel to the Channel Islands. It's a very short flight for something like an, an eagle or a red-tailed hawk, and then pooped out some of those spores and inoculated the island with those spores. That probably still happens today. Um, so the Channel Islands of California are well within dispersal distance by a multitude of different vector types. Okay, I hadn't thought about poop as a, as a vector. Um, uh, Vanessa asked, is it easy to access some of the islands? If you go through the company called Island Packers that leads from Ventura Harbor, it's a relatively short boat ride to get to Santa Cruz Island, Santa Barbara Island, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel. It takes just a few hours. On a choppy day, it might take a little longer. And if you get really seasick, it might be a little bit uncomfortable. But um, it, it's not a bad ride. And you can camp on them, depending on the time of year. If you get used to it, um, it actually becomes pretty easy. You, you learn how to pack for it. And it's not that expensive. Um, it does cost some amount of money and you do have to plan for it, but it's less expensive than the gas you might spend driving to the Sierra Nevada. Uh, Christian, I, I was wondering, you, you, you showed that map of- Any uh, other questions uh, in the chat? You can just unmute yourself oh, yeah. and ask me about it. Yeah, Richard, what's up? Uh, I was wondering, you showed that map of North America with the oak distribution from the East Coast going down into Mexico and then back up, you know, uh, toward the, the West Coast. And I was wondering, you know, the uh, do, has there been any study about the, uh, you know, there, there are mushrooms associated with those oak species, but I wonder if there's any um, uh, genetic differences as you as you make your way down the the East Coast down into Mexico and then back up for the for the fungi as well as for the oak species. I know that we're not they're not doing DNA analysis of of, plant, of of trees and stuff like that so much as as we're looking at microflora, you know, of mm -hmm. the fungi. But I just wondered if you know you showed all these bully species, and I just wondered, you know, is there a, a, a an evolution of the genetics of those species as they as they make their way around? Yeah, the answer is yes. <clears throat> a lot of the bolates that are in Arizona that appear to be the same as the ones in the East are not genetically the same. There has been divergence. And in some cases, enough divergence that we consider it borderline a different species. And in other cases, it is still borderline. It's still somewhat divergent, but apparently contiguous. Um, with its Eastern counterpart. So it's not a clear cut answer for all of them, but I would say in general, um, the divergence is there and it appears to be becoming more isolated over time. We're not gonna see that forest regrow anytime soon. So they're not gonna be becoming more connected with their ancestral populations. They're probably gonna continue diverging for the foreseeable future and the unforeseeable future. Well, isn't there a lot of species divergence but in the oaks? So the associations yeah. would change. Yeah, the oaks themselves are quite different. There's very few shared oak hosts um, between the east and, 
and, and Arizona. In fact, the, the oaks of Arizona are kind of more related to Mexican species in many cases than they are to anything you find in the Eastern California. Christian, in, in Hawaii, I was uh, recently there and they mentioned that the uh, Polynesians would um, bring plants over from their island chains to Hawaii. Um, and I thought of the potential of, of mushrooms kind of tagging along for that ride. Was there any, was there anything similar to that? And possibly with the Native Americans um, at a time, you mentioned uh, they had trading going on between, between them. Could there be like plants and what other uh, like food, plant-based food sources are there on the islands? I mean, I think the acorns explain it all, basically. If you, if you bring acorns over, um, there's no way you're not bringing endosymbiotic fungi. There's vertical transmission of fungi from parent oak trees to offspring oak trees by cells living inside their propagules. There's, there's already fungi living in acorns by the time they're dropped off the tree. So if they're bringing acorns as part of their food supply from the mainland to the islands, Indigenous people were transporting fungi without even necessarily doing it on purpose. Um, it was an indirect corollary just arriving with their, with their food source. But the wood of their tomol boats probably brought spores. Um, the island foxes that they may have brought over intentionally probably had dirt under their toenails. Like spores are at the level of undetectability and ubiquity that they are moving anytime people are moving even if it's unintentional. Oh, Stu, Stu had a really good question. Um, what is the inverse of release from competition? Are there any examples on the islands where there's greatly heightened competition? And I think you could certainly make the argument that the answer is yes. Um, islands tend to have these funny, directly inverse phenomena happening simultaneously. Um, you both get island dwarfism in some species, as well as island gigantism in other species. So it's a well-known phenomenon in animals that when certain lineages disperse to islands, they often either become huge or they become tiny compared to the ancestral population. So it is definitely the case that uh, totally opposed uh, forces act on the same lineages. Now I'm trying to think of a concrete example to answer Stu's question about heightened competition. Um, I would say that if you are the only pine, for example, there is less partitioning of pine root space between pine mycorrhizals on the island. So you might get species that normally would grow with a different species of pine or sorting themselves between different pine hosts on the mainland, all having to compete their spores are all having to sort of germinate and make it work with a single pine species on the island. So it's possible that simply because the host range is limited, that uh, mycorrhizal species are actually having to deal with more competition for root space. Um, once again, these are very hard things to study concretely because it all happens underground. We have no way of directly measuring it, but there are probably some clever ways to strategize um, studying this that, that might make these patterns show in a way that you could defend but I'd have to guess at it from an intuitive natural history perspective observation at this point. Any other questions? <clears throat> um, I, had, I had one about, we talk about the transmission, you know, uh, intentionally or unintentionally of, uh, of spores, you know, carried by plants, animals, and and human beings with acorns and stuff. Um, I do. Do we know if there if it, if there is much in the way of um, uh, use of fungi by Native Americans? You know, per se. Um, I know that you know they use certain plants and things like that, but you know, in in Europe and Asia, they they have a long history of association with fungi. But here in North America, was there very much, you know, a use by, uh, you know, you probably couldn't go, you know, uh, on it unless, you know, you studied 
the, the remnants of the Native American populations here in the United States. But like, for example, the Yurox and stuff like that, they associate with salmon fishing and that sort of thing. But were there, uh, were there, were there uh, societies that actually used mushrooms to a, uh, to a greater extent than, than you know, uh, or to an extent that, that we use them today? Uh, or is it, it just something that, that just, you know, um, they happenstance, you know, took things along with them and it was not really a major a food source or a medicinal source or things like that, unlike the other continents like Asia and that sort of thing. The first thing I should say is I, I'm, I don't know, this is outside my wheelhouse. I'm not an expert on anthropological uses of fungi. And the second thing I would say is that it's hard to know in the aftermath of genocide. There was a major disruption to cultural continuity and a relative uninterest or scarce interest in recording what little there was left after the sort of uh, sweep of the missionaries through the Native American population in California, such that whatever we think we know now is only what we think we know. It is not what was. Um, so there's relatively little left for us to try and reconstruct of what might have been cultural practice before, uh, before colonial contact. That said, we do know that um, there are a few examples that are well documented in Western literature, in academic literature, about Native American use of fungi. So we know that things like some polypores, um, some puffballs, um, were used both ceremonial and ritual, ceremonially and ritualistically as well as for food or medicine. But I would say that I don't know enough to really answer your question. And we as sort of an academic community might not be able to know enough because that's what genocide does. Is it destroys knowledge and it, it doesn't preserve what, what was known. Yeah. Well, um, and I was going to say in uh, Mexico and uh, you know, Northern Central America, where there was, shall we say, less genocide than in Anglo North America, uh, there's sort of a continuous uh, history of mushroom uh, use in those cultures. I yeah. Mean, and for while both I... food and and other purposes. Well, I don't necessarily think that it's uh, obvious that because in some nearby indigenous areas, like Northern Mexico, for example, where there yeah. still is sort of an unbroken chain of, of engagement with wild mushrooms, it doesn't necessarily mean that the same was true in California. You Correct. could expect that, that they probably did use it just like any other indigenous community that has access to a lot of wild fungi, which certainly they would have. We all know what it's like in, in California on the coast in the winter. There's no reason to suspect that they didn't use it, um, that resource. Okay, Stephen asked, do you know of any studies investigating gene flow between the mainland and Channel Island species? The first place that I would point you, and maybe the only place that I would know to point you, is Lisa Grubisha's paper on Rhizopogon. Um, it's a particular kind of truffle that she studied on the Channel Island specifically. I think she mostly looked at gene flow within the Channel Island system, but she probably included some reference, if I recall correctly, to gene flow with the mainland, but it's been a while since I've read that paper. But Lisa Grubisha, here, I'll just type her name. Um, Rhizopogon. Google those search terms and you will find the paper. Great, thanks. Okay, it's nine o'clock. If no one has, else has any questions, thanks for having me tonight. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in person next year. Well, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, glad you could join this, join us and glad you could set up all of these wonderful talks. For those that don't know, uh, Christian actually organized this entire uh, lecture series. So. Oh, I would say Dan had at least half of the uh, organizational responsibility here because he he set up all this Zoom meeting stuff. So thanks to Dan for helping put this on. Oh, thank you. Oh, and and someone put in a note here that's important. Wednesday, January eighteenth, Noah Siegel, my co-author on Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, will be speaking for the general meeting. Um, it is always a good talk when Noah speaks. He's got amazing photos, um, and and really good insights into global fungi. So definitely tune in or appear in person, I guess.